So I study different planets, uh, Earth and Mars, but I use satellites. So I use satellites around the Earth to look at Earth, and I use satellites around the Mars to look at Mars. So I'm going to talk to you about the Earth satellites and some of the stuff that you can do to solve uh, problems that are important that we might want to look at about the environment on Earth and how we can use some basics of satellite remote sensing to solve some of the things that you came up with that you were really interested in. So I thought I'd take you through a few really basic, sciencey basics um, that can help you understand some questions that you might want to frame about how do I choose the kind of things I need on my sensor to answer the questions that I'm important, that I'm interested in for my project. So whether it's looking at vegetation, looking at ozone, uh, looking at the coral reefs, or looking at uh, the albedo of the earth. How do I start to think about what kind of sensor I need, what needs to go on that sensor on a spacecraft? So the key thing really is to think about spectra. So that's the one science thing we're going to talk about, which is spectra. So spectra is really, uh, it's like a fingerprint. So probably you all heard that every human being has a unique fingerprint. Really, it's the same with the material. Every material has a unique fingerprint, but it's like a fingerprint in light, and we call it its spectrum. So when light interacts with an object, some of that light is absorbed and some of it is reflected. It bounces off the object, essentially. It's reflected away. So that kind of interaction gives every object that unique fingerprint in light, and we call it its spectrum. So if you know the spectrum of an object, then you know how to identify in a satellite image, whether it be a photograph that you've taken on your phone, and I'll show you an RGB photo, and how you can really use spectra in that to identify an object, and you'll be able to do it yourself. Or whether it's in a satellite photo where we've got lots of different parts of the spectrum, not just red, green, and blue where you've got the whole visible spectrum, or you've got microwaves, infrared, x-rays, UV, the whole part of it. So spectrum is just the way that an object interacts with light. So if we have a photo that is just red, green, blue, so red, green, blue, light, an RGB photograph, and here we have it where we're just looking in one part of the spectrum. So we're just looking in either the red, the green, or the blue. So what part of the spectrum do you think we're looking at? Can anybody guess? If you look here, which part of the parrot is brightest? Is it the red part of the parrot that's brightest, or the blue part, or the green part? It's the red part. So the beak that's red, the feathers that's red, they're the parts that are the brightest. So this is an image that's just taken in the red part of the spectrum, okay? So this is just a red light image of the parrot. So this, this is going to be what part of the spectrum? Yeah, that's just a blue light image of the parrot because you can see that the brightest parts are his head and his tummy, the blue parts are really bright and the other parts that they don't reflect blue light, so they're darker in the blue. And so the last one is the green light image. So the parts that reflect green light are really bright in the green, and the other parts that absorb more of the green light are dark in the green. And that's all it is to spectrum, is the parts that reflect and the parts that absorb. So if we know that for different materials, then we can understand how to see them in a satellite image, whether you want to look at trees or whether you want to look at ozone. It's just knowing how those materials reflect or absorb light in different parts of the spectrum. So now I can show you for your different applications what kind of wavelengths you might want to look at. Do you want to look at the red, the green and the blue? Or maybe you want to look at a different part of the spectrum for your materials. What part of light is going to be the most useful to look at the materials that you're interested in? So, don't worry about... Let me get rid of those words. Don't worry about the squiggly lines. Oh, no, what did I do? 
I killed it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to delete my text. My one? Yeah, just delete the text. All right, don't worry about the squiggly lines. You don't need to know stuff like that. The, this is just to show you, just so that you can get a sense for what a spectrum of a real material on the surface of the Earth looks like. So this is called a spectra. So this is a spectra of vegetation, so plants, at different wavelengths of light. So these numbers are just different wavelengths. So down here we've got the red, green and the blue that we were looking at in the parrot. And then as you go along, you go to longer wavelengths. So like the infrared all the way through to longer. And if you went to shorter, then you go to like the violet or to the UV. So the harmful stuff that gets through the ozone layer. So this is just different wavelengths of light. But as you can see, the different squiggly lines just show us that different materials behave differently. So... If you look here at the green, well, the vegetation is going to be green. But if you look here in the red, vegetation is darker than soil. Soil is brighter. But in the near infrared, vegetation is really bright. It's brighter than soil. So that gives us different ways of telling them apart. So if you want to look at vegetation, you can see, well, it's dark at red wavelengths and it's bright in the infrared. So that gives us good ways of separating out vegetation from other things. Was there a question? Uh, yeah, well, could you explain the vertical axis? Yep. So the vertical axis here is just how bright something is in an image. So it's like when we go back to that parrot image. So it's like if you're in an image like this, if something's really bright or if something's medium bright or if something's dark. That's how that part of the graph, the vertical axis. So if it's up high, that means it would be really bright in an image. Or if it's down low, that means that it would be dark in an image. It wouldn't stand out really brightly. So that's what that vertical axis is on that plot. So that means that if you take an image in these bands down here in the near infrared, vegetation would be really bright and soil would be dark. So you would be able to see what was vegetation in one of those photos because it would be the really bright colours. So if you wanted to see vegetation in your satellite, then you would want a camera that would take photos in the red and in the near infrared. And you'd be able to pick out trees and forests and see them really well. So for an example, or if I do this, will it kill it again? I don't know. Let's you find know, out. That URL <laughs> in. So this is a global forest map, and this is exactly what they've done, is take photos from a satellite in the near infrared and the red, so just two wavelengths, instead of red and green, they use red and near infrared, so just two different colours, essentially, of light. And they've tracked how much the trees have changed over time. So let's go somewhere up here, let's go to part of Indonesia, and let's drag it back. So instead of 2001, let's go back to, say, 2008. Okay, so green is where there's forest. And let's go up here. Let's go up to where the orangutans are. So the orangutans can only live. This is Borneo. So the orangutans, the only natural habitat in Indonesia is right at the northern tip here of Borneo. I love orangutans. So. Okay. <laughs> Red hair. Um, so here we go. So orangutans live up here in this forest, only in the northern tip of Borneo. So as you can see, there's been some deforestation here in the areas of red. So that's where some forest has been lost because they've had to do plantations and other things. 
for farming and to survive. So as we drag it up over time, you can see how the deforestation is spread. And you get these special patterns that form these kind of spiral patterns, and that's because of how they drive up the roads and then they spread out from there. So that's a particular pattern of deforestation in the plantation building. So if we drag it up over time, you can see the pattern of deforestation spreading. So now we're in 2014, and now we're in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 2021, and there we are. So that's a lot of forest that's been lost with the orangutan habitat. So that's something that you can do in your project if you're looking at forest loss, and that just uses two wavelengths of light um, on a satellite camera. And you can track how much your trees are changing over time. All right, should we swap back to this? That's a very powerful tool to be able to track that over time and measure how much the forest is changing in any part of the world and for any reason. So another project was to look at coral bleaching from space. So if we look at this photo, there's some bleached coral and there's some not bleached coral. And what do you notice about the colour of the bleached coral? It's white. So in terms of light, it's very bright and this is dark. So if you have an image of it from space, you would expect that this is in that brightness of the parrot, where we have light and dark, this is going to have very bright values and this is going to have very low values. So do you think you could see that in a satellite image from space? Some maybes? Yeah? Yes, you can. Absolutely you can. And so that's what some people have done just recently, actually. So here they have a satellite image and they've used four colours, but actually they only really needed to use two. And what they found is that the bleached coral is very bright and it's just flat. It's the same in all colours. And that probably makes sense, right? Because when it's white, it's really, it's got the same amount of red and green and white. It's really got none of them. It's just flat. It's the same in all colours. And the healthy coral is here and it's got different squiggly lines. And you can see here in a more detailed spectrum, it's got all squiggly bumps. But the bleach coral is just flat and it's much brighter. It's sitting higher because it's bright. So if you look down from space, so here they are, they've used some sites in the Australian coral reef. And you can see even in the satellite image, when you zoom right in, there's healthy coral and it's dark. And there's bleach coral and it's very bright. So you can see that in a satellite image as well. So it comes back again to the spectrum, to knowing that it's going to reflect that light. It's going to be very bright in an image because of how the material has changed. It's bleached, and so it will reflect that light. And so you can see that in your multispectral camera. So what about looking at albedo changes? Well, that is very interesting. So that can be very important if we're looking at the impact on global warming. So one reason that we might want to do that is to look at how much of the sunlight that comes down to the earth is then reflected back into space. And so people often look at that in terms of the earth's energy budget. That's saying how much of the energy that comes to the sun, that comes to the earth from the sun, uh, is then reflected back out to, the, to space. But another way of looking at that same question is also to look at, well, what's the temperature of the surface. So that's related to the albedo. The temperature of the surface will be related to how bright or how dark it is. But actually we can directly measure the temperature by putting a temperature sensor on your satellite. So if you put a thermal sensor on your satellite, you can measure how hot the surface of the land is. So that's called land surface temperature. What is the temperature of the materials on the ground? And that becomes really important when we do stuff like looking at urban heat islands and the effect of cities. So when they measure that from satellites, they find that 
It can be nice and cool in areas where you have vegetation, but where you have big built up cities, it becomes really hot. And that's because of the high albedo in part, and because of the materials that we're using, and that's reflecting a lot of energy and making things really hot. Whereas if you put a lot of vegetation in your suburbs, a lot of green space, a lot of parks, then it cools things down and that's much better for the earth. So you could address that question by putting a temperature sensor on your satellite and actually measuring the impact of green space and how different cities that have a lot of green space, a lot of parks in their planning have actually managed to cool their cities down. Another thing, another question that one of your groups had was to detect ozone from space and that's really important and you can detect ozone from space by looking in the, in, in the UV and that makes sense because ozone is really important because it absorbs UV. So ozone absorbs, as you can see here, certain wavelengths of ultraviolet but it lets some UV through. So you can see here the UVA, the UVB and the UVC. But ozone is so important because it protects us from those most harmful UV layers, from the most harmful UV radiation. And when ozone is damaged and when that layer thins, then more of that damaging UV gets through and it harms fall to our <coughs> skin. So by putting a UV <coughs> sensor on your spacecraft, you can actually have a look at how much of that UV is getting absorbed and then you can measure how much, how thick that layer of ozone is. And they've actually been doing this recently on the Sentinel Tropomi satellite and they've measured how thick that layer of ozone is and had a look at this growing hole. There's Australia up there. So this is that growing hole over Antarctica. So that's something that you can measure by looking at UV. So I think that's all for me. Hopefully that's given you a few ideas about how to approach each one of your projects and how it ties into spectra and how your materials interact with light. But I'll be around if you have any questions. So, yeah, that's all for me.